All right, so first of all, uh, we're using, as usual, uh, Widowson's book, A Bible Believer Looks at World History. A Bible Believer Looks at World History. And then we're continuing off on the Inca Empire. Let's go to page 187. 187. All right, so remember, if you recall, Etawalpa and Washkar, they're actually uh, versing each other. And then Vashkar, he actually, or Washkar, he actually lost to Etawalpa. So Etawalpa took over the Inca Empire, and we heard the cultural descriptions of that time, how ridiculous it was, how they deified their kings and their emperors. And it turned, uh, they became a very wealthy, rich empire, but they become very dependent. And because of that state, which is where America's headed toward, if some of you didn't notice, so that's what's becoming of our country too. So uh, with this socialist mindset, where people become dependent more on their government, what happens is that when a smaller enemy came, the Inca Empire just fell kaput. It just fell completely. And they had all the resources, they had all the artillery, the numbers, and everything to outnumber. But let's see what happened. Remember, it was a great day of exploration as well from Spain and Portugal and then uh, their fellow European nations. So, one of the people who landed on the shores of the Inca Empire, Pizarro. All right, let's look at page 187. And then we're at the middle paragraph where it starts off with in October or November. In October or November. In October or November of 1532, the victors learned that a pale, hairy people who sat on enormous animals had landed on the coast. So that is... Those are the European conquerors. Etawopa, curious, was content to wait for the new visitors to come to him. Bizarro, leader of the expedition of only 168 Spanish soldiers. That's it. They only had 168 Spanish soldiers with them. Managed to arrange the place of the meeting with the emperor. At Caamarca, so remember, uh, this is a main place that uh, Etawalpa, uh, he had some dealings with. Now, Pizarro, this is the main city and area where all the action occurred, all right? At Calamarca. As we continue on, on November 16, 1532, the Spanish, vastly outnumbered by thousands of Inca, armed only with ceremonial weapons, specifically for the meeting with the aliens, had hid their horses and cannon out of sight. So that's what they did while they were being vastly outnumbered. The Spanish were so scared of this mighty emperor and his large army that Pizarro wrote that many men wet themselves in terror while waiting. So they actually peed their pants. That's the original Greek translation for some of you who didn't understand that. So they were terrified because they were like literally... Uh, huge numbers that swarmed around them, and they only had 168 on their side, the Spaniards. So they were vastly outnumbered, and they were scared. A Spanish priest presented Etawalpa with the breviary, a uh, book containing hymns and prayers, which, as it meant nothing to him, was promptly and contemptuously thrown aside. Oh, okay, so that's how they treated that precious book of him and Catholic prayers. Yeah, sounds like a Bible believer, right? <laughs> this pagan what, had a little bit of a mindset of a Bible believer. But anyway, this was to the Spanish a legitimate reason to attack. Why? Because you just threw away our, uh, something precious or valuable to us. So they took that as a threat. So then that was the signal. The attacking Spanish mounted on horses in metal armor and firing cannons, none of which the Inca had ever seen or heard before, routed the thousands of Inca troops in a stampede that trampled hundreds to death, actually. So then hundreds of Inca soldiers were being trampled to death by the Spaniards. Etawalpa was captured after Pizarro personally grabbed him and dragged him from his litter. So remember that golden litter that he's in, kind of like the, His Majesty the Pope, if you recall about the descriptions of 
the Inca emperor, how he was treated. So he just pulled him off of his golden litter because remember, he, to touch the earth, the ground, is too low for him. He cannot do that because he's like deity. His personal servants, this is so sad, and this is so stupid. Uh, you can laugh or cry, whatever. His personal servants were so loyal that when the Spanish cut off their hands, they still tried to hoist the emperor's litter on their shoulders. I mean, you talk about darkness, blindness from full-blown Satanism. That's really messed up. Bizarro was not impressed with his victory, as his writings reveal that he knew he had marched his men into the jaws of a great empire, and his greed and lust for gold was more than matched by his fear. Etawopa realized early on that gold and precious metals had power over the European mind in a way that they did not over the Inca, because the Inca had no currency. So then what did Etawopa do to rescue uh, his kingdom and to uh, control the Europeans, to chase them away? He offered his gold to them. Now remember, the Inca Empire was filled with so much gold and gone just like that. I mean, uh, like the Bible says, uh, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeared for a little time and then vanisheth away. Uh, we're going to look at the book of Matthew. Here's a good example, all right? All right, we're going to go to chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and then we'll look at verse 19, verse 19. So what did God say? Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth. Why? Because uh, it just takes a moment. They can take it all away. And that's what people are doing right now. They trust their government too much to build their economy, and then they build up their own economy. You know what? Just takes uh, one little crisis, gone, just like that. All right, verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Well, guess what? Um, the Spaniards, I guess uh, their treasures were not in heaven, even though they were supposed to be religious Catholics. It was all the earth. So what happened? Let's keep reading onward. He offered to fill a room 22 feet by 17 feet full of gold objects in return for his freedom. Bizarro agreed to his offer. That's huge. Etawalpa had his general strip Cusco of its silver and gold. So Cusco is where all the gold uh, he stored up. And then he just emptied its coffers. Having not actually lived in the city since his youth, he had no attachment to it. So uh, Etawopa, remember, uh, he, had, uh, he had a different city that he was attached to or had in mind. And so because of that, that's the reason why he could care less that he just stripped the city of its silver and gold, which was gone just like that. At the same time, he had the captive uh, Washkar kill, and all of his own surviving brothers to ensure that no one would ally themselves with the invader and against him. All right, so Washkar, remember, who used to be the prisoner, at the same time where he stripped the gold, he killed him. Why? Because he's afraid that him or his family members might side with the Europeans. And actually, he's on the ball right there because let's see what happens later on. Let's keep reading. Between December of 1532 and May of 1533, caravans of gold and silver flooded into Kaamarca on the backs of llamas. Without the emperor, the entire land of Tavantinsuyu, so that's the whole culture of the Inca Empire, all right? That's their culture. Tavans, uh, Tavantinsuyu was frozen. No one was able to act against the Spaniards. It was the nature of their empire, absolute control from the top, and no action without the emperor's will or word. Why? Because they became so dependent, socialist, 
on the emperor, the government. But because the emperor is captured and gone, everyone freaked out. And uh, that's all it takes for America. You know, you just take away old Joe and then America will go, oh, what are we going to do? You know, we lost such a dependable guy, you know. <laughs> this guy was suffering Alzheimer's and we managed to get away with it. Now we just lost a guy who can guide us. <laughs> all right. Anyway, I'm just joking. But anyway, let's keep reading here. And kind of not. But anyway, <laughs> it was the nature, it was the nature of their empire, absolute control from the top and no action without the emperor's will or word. The Spaniards were not able to handle the tension, the expectation of being massacred at any moment, and they did not keep their part of the bargain. They strangled Atahualpa, then they marched on to Cusco. In one fell stroke, a motley band of 168 soldiers and priests had destroyed the largest contiguous empire on earth at that time. The Incas were defeated by superior technology first, but in the long run, it was their inability to act independently against a common threat that finished them. So that's what did the job. The Incas' absolute dependence on the protection and authority of the top level of government, sounds like today, obviously, made them helpless when that top level was not capable of wielding power. That sounds like today, obviously. The Spanish' great challenge was a massive Inca road system. So the Inca had a road system. So they had everything where they could have won and etc. But so look at the challenges that the Spaniards faced when they conquered the Inca Empire. Like you could make a movie out of this actually. It's very interesting. The Inca road system was not designed for horses, but for men and llamas. It often went straight up like giant stairways, which is probably the reason why you'll see these kind of buildings in South America not a problem for them, maybe, for these long stairways. Well, let's keep reading here. And was perfect for ambushing men forced to lead their horses. Spanish adventurer Alonso Enriquez de Guzman reported in his writings that Inca stone slingers, much like David in his confrontation with Goliath, could kill a horse or break a sword into pieces with one stone slung at 30 paces. That's how skilled those Inca warriors were. The Inca ambushers were, would also heat stones. They would heat the stones until they were red hot and then wrap them in pitch-soaked cotton, slinging them at the invaders with deadly success, something which could be done faster than a primitive firearm could be fired accurately and reloaded. That's true. So they could have had many chances to win. Added to the bows, javelins, maces, and clubs, they were fearsome, nearly silent weapons of attack on the high mountain roads. What made them all lose? A socialist mindset. That's why Satan wants to make it a socialist mindset. Smallpox uh, always seemed to precede the arrival of the Spanish into the interior areas of South America because it traveled faster than the conquerors did. So that was what did the job is smallpox. You're going to hear that quite often when the explorers or the Europeans come down to the Americas, then it brought disease along with them. And that became the big downfall of civilizations in uh, North and South America, the diseases that some of the Europeans brought. But let's keep reading here. The disease that killed Huayna uh, Capac and his son was most definitely that scourge of mankind. It is said by Inca and Spanish chroniclers to have killed 200,000 people in the epidemic that swept through the empire before the Spanish arrived. One of the most bizarre conditions of the Spanish conquest had to do, now this is very satanic, with the dead emperors of the past. Okay, this practice, for some of you who don't know, it's written on the board over here. Peinaca, all right? Peinaca. Now, what is Peinaca? It is described as follows. Each new emperor was born into a Peinaca and created his own when he put the fringe on his head that symbolized his position. When the Inca died, his lineage, which is the Peinaca, mummified his body. Because he was believed now to be a deity, because he's got that penaka, right? Immortal, 
his body was treated as if it was still alive. Now, you notice the practice of the Egyptians. A lot of what they followed was similar to the Egyptians when they mummified the body. Why? Because they just want to retain something what's left over in deity or whatever they want to call it. Where did they get all these ideas from? And then I pointed out to you that if it did come from Egypt, those sons of God, and then they went to Canaan, and then it went to Britain during the time of King Arthur, if he did exist, and then switched down all the way to the Americas, if it just kept going that way, it can make a lot of sense. But uh, that one is just a theory on my part, but that's how I see a route. It would make a lot more sense on the later cultures and civilization, why they had a lot of similarities. But uh, reading onward, Pizarro's friend, Miguel de Este, saw a parade of dead emperors brought out on litters, seated on their thrones, surrounded by pages and women with fly whisks in their hands, who treated them with as much respect as they would had they been alive. Man, you talk about satanic paganism, blindness. Because the royal mummies were not considered dead, the new emperor could not inherit their wealth or palaces, clothing, or even, or even their eating utensils. Now, did you hear what I just said right here? The next emperor could not get the old emperor's utensils. Why? Because it still belongs to the old emperor, not even his chopstick, okay? <laughs> In Inca society, the emperor literally could take it with him. They still retained tribute over the lands they had conquered in life. Dead people, okay? Imagine paying a dead, a dead body. That, that, that's ridiculous. Pedro Pizarro wrote that the greater part of the Inca people, uh, Inca people were under the control of the dead. The mummy spoke through female mediums. All right, and that's not new. That's found at Scripture. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 11. You can look over there if you want. All right, let's look at over there. Let's look at two places. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and 1 Samuel 28. Deuteronomy 18 and 1 Samuel 28. All right, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 11. Verse 11, Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we'll read verse 11. The Bible says, Or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. So that's a person who supposedly consults the spirit of the dead. Now look at 1 Samuel 28, okay? Now notice that she was able to bring back the dead. So some of these people could do that. So this is very strange, wicked stuff that could actually happen. 1 Samuel chapter 28. Notice that we'll look at verse 7. Then said Saul unto his servant, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And then notice at verse 11. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And she was able to do that at verse 13. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? So notice that this satanic power can be real and is scary. All right, let's go back here. So how much of it was completely pagan or even sometimes legit because Satan can do stuff like that at times? Let's see the result at page 188. With almost a dozen immortal emperors fighting for position, yeah, no kidding, 
Upper levels of Inca society were constantly embroiled in a supernatural sort of horror movie-like intrigue with the dead jockeying for positions of power and influence in a way that shocked the Spanish. It was as if they had landed on another planet, which is a sentiment we would feel today. The Spanish not being indoctrinated in our Star Trek, Star Wars entertainments merely looked at these people as demon-possessed and as under Satan's power. Yeah, they got that right. They just don't realize they're also following the same devil. <laughs> Although this was true, it was of course also true of the Spanish. Wena Capac had complained that he could not even build his own villa on Akepata because his undead ancestors had used up all of the available space. <laughs> With the decimation caused by the smallpox epidemic, the undead fought for power. Etawopa had Tupa Inca's mummy burned alive, so to speak. And then he ordered the gold for his ransom stolen from another long dead rival, supposedly, which is Pashakuti. Washkar, in death, kept the civil war going by dealing with the Spanish through his spokesman, his witch. So Washkar, remember, he died. The witch continued it on as his spokesman, as his representative. <laughs> so let's see what happened, all right? This is, I mean, if you make a movie about this, it's like horror movie. You can make an appropriate, appropriate horror uh, adventure movie over here. Washkar kept in death, kept the civil war going by dealing with the Spanish through his spokeswoman, his witch. Uh, let's skip down here. Uh, Washkar's... Penaka sent one of his younger brothers, Thupawolpa. All right, so this is the guy, Thupawolpa. So now we come to here, and then look at the grabs for power here as we go down. All right, look at these names. Thupawolpa to Kaamarca to meet with Pizarro. Proclaiming that he was Washkar's legitimate heir, Pizarro hid him in his own quarters for his safety. So he took care of him. Pizarro helped him. So that's what Etowalpa dreaded, right? So that uh, Washkar's uh, descendants or friends would probably turn against him somehow. So let's see what happens. Pizarro was warned that Etowalpa's army, tens of thousands strong, was on its way to annihilate him for revenge. So Etowalpa wanted revenge now. He was told that its general planned on freeing the emperor, but Etowalpa denied the claim was true. So Etowalpa, who was taken prisoner, remember, he was saying, uh, no, 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 uh, my people are not coming after you. I don't have an army. My top generals aren't after you. You know, this is all not true. Well, what happened? Surprisingly, some of the Spaniards were sympathetic to Etowalpa's plight and asked for an investigation. However, Two Inca, who had claimed they had fled the invading army, came to Pizarro and also warned him of the disaster to come. So that convinced him more against, to be against uh, Etowalpa. So what did Pizarro do? Convened a military tribunal and Etowalpa was condemned and executed. The thinking being that the army would not invade if he were dead. Too late, it was learned that no such army was on the way and Thupawolpa emerged from hiding to take on role of the new emperor. Oh, what a tricky, tricky guy, yeah. All right, Berkeley archaeologist John Rowe claims that the execution of Etowolpa was part of a conspiracy between Pizarro and Thupawolpa and the lord of Caamarca, who had been allied with Washkar. Tupawopa openly claimed allegiance to Spain. So because remember, the Spaniards took over. So then he uh, pledged allegiance. And let's see what happens. They then left for the capital, Cusco. So remember, Cusco is the capital. But remember, Etowalpa didn't really have an attachment over there. He had a different region in mind, if you recall. So now they're heading toward the capital because that's where they want the whole power. So let's see what happens. But on the way, ran into the first real resistance to Pizarro, but local people, native Zalca and Wanka tribes, provided supplies to Pizarro and prevented Etowalpa's army from burning the town of Hautunzogza. Right after the battle, Tupawopa died suddenly. 
And the Spanish believed he had been poisoned. Yeah, because they probably didn't like the guy. What an evil guy, right? So what happened? Chai Kochima, one of Etowopa's generals, who had been captured by Pizarro, was the prime suspect in Tupawopa's poisoning. So this is the next guy. He was the one on Etowopa's side. So then he's been suspect. So what happened? He stepped forward to convince Pizarro that the next Inca emperor should be one of Etowopa's sons. So it should be Etowopa's sons that should take over the empire, not Tupawopa. So then what happened at the end? <laughs> you <laughs> Meanwhile, Washkar's Penaka, oh, what did, what did the Penaka say then, all right, on Washkar's side? Sent out another son, Manco Inca, this guy, who promised to swear allegiance to Spain as well. In return, he asked that Pizarro kill Chai Cochima. Pizarro agreed, and the Spaniards publicly burned the general in one of the towns they came to on their journey. So that's a Catholic, typical Catholic thing to do, right? that they do. The Spanish were amazed at the vast population of the Inca Empire, which even after the first smallpox epidemic that killed Huayna Capac, was huge estimated by some, but not all archaeologists and historians as in the millions. Smallpox struck the empire again in 1533, 1535, 1558, and 1565. Best on modern Epidemiological studies, uh, some researchers believe that 90% of Tavantinsuyu citizens, so remember that's their whole Inca culture, the Inca empire were killed. So it was through disease. But then you're going to find out that was uh, pretty much the case with uh, the Mayans that we described earlier. But we'll get back to them later on as they continued. But uh, Pizarro, what happened at the end is, what's funny, if you look at page 265, there were other uh, European people who took over Pizarro's kingdom, so to speak. So he had his gold, he had his wealth, and guess what? He was a thief, and uh, in return, other thieves took it from him. And it was uh, him with a small band that took over the Inca empire. In return, it was a small band of rebels that turned against Pizarro and killed him and took over his power. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. That's what it is, typical human nature. Okay, so that's where we cover them. Now we're going to cover the interesting uh, kingdom. Remember the Olmec Empire? So the Olmec, remember their buildings were described. That's where you get all those... Um, beautiful structures and strange paganism going on in South America. They, you see these pyramid-like structures, and it was the height of civilization, remember, the Olmec culture that time. And in the Maya civilization, they were able to share, uh, they were able to, um, to interact and then have some dealings as well. So during that, those early centuries, the Olmec culture, it's pretty much faded away so then they left their buildings behind. When they left their buildings behind, and then you can research this yourself, but as they left their buildings behind, another group of people started to inhabit those old buildings and took it over. And they saw the deified structures and then the, the spiritual supernatural stuff within the walls and then the monuments, the buildings, and etc. So then these people took this Olmec civilization and deified it, and worshipped it, and continued its practice. So then, the Olmec culture, which I told you could have been the timeline when the sons of God uh, shipped out and went to the Americas. And it could have been during that time they built their civilization, their structure, following a pattern of what they did back in Egypt. But then the Olmec culture just faded away, and this brand new group of people took it over now. Page 223. The famous Aztecs. All right, now let's cover the Aztecs. But guess what? As with all uh, European exploration and conquest, faded away again. So let's see how they faded away. 
Early in the 14th century, that is the 1300s, the, uh, let's, uh, let's call them Aztecs, a nomadic warlike tribe from northern Mexico arrived in what is called the Valley of Mexico and settled on two islands called Tenochtitlan and Tatelolco. All right, so these two areas, that's where it began. And then they were wanderers that time, okay? And they came toward that region. In Lake Texcoco, this natural forest connected by only three causeways to the mainland with removable bridges, so thus gave, you can picture and see it gave them a secure base to operate from, and successful wars combined with smart alliances helped them to conquer the Valley of Mexico. So then they were able to conquer that whole terrain of the Valley of Mexico. The era of 1427 to 1440 saw the rise of their emperor, which is, pronou which is pronounced as Itcoatl, okay, Itcoatl, the Black Serpent who defeated the Tepanaka, who tried to destroy them in fear of their growing mastery of the area. So, Itcoatl, that's the big guy that built up its power for the Aztec Empire. But then his nephew was the main muscle. His name is Tlaquelel, Tlaquelel. So, who lived for 82 years from 1398 to 1480 who was the real genius of the Aztecs. So it was these two guys. Now, let's see how it developed into something here, okay? So let me move aside here. He was twice offered the leadership, but turned it down twice. Okay, why is it that uh, Tlaquelel uh, uh, turned down the leadership? Why would he do that? The reason why he turned down the leadership because he preferred to be the influential head of internal affairs and truly ruling behind the scenes for much of his life. He was responsible for destroying the Aztec history of what? Their humble beginnings where they were nomads, okay? So remember, they were nomads, but then he destroyed the history. Why? He wanted to create something so he could instill a new kind of heroic patriotism in them. With this prompting, the Aztec would think that he was always great and that empire was his heritage. This instilled a super patriotic loyalty in the members of what was called the Triple Alliance. So then it's kind of like communist China, so to speak. So the idea is, you know, if you look at the beginning, we always started out great and we were always great and we were always powerful. So he wanted to create that kind of history for them instead of their humble beginnings as nomads. All right, Tlaquelel served as a general under Itzcoatl and believed that the uh, Aztecs were destined to be a great empire. All right, what happened? Tlaquelel created an ideology based on the notion that Huitzilopochtli, the god who wore a hummingbird head-shaped helmet and carried a fire-breathing serpent as a weapon. So that's him over here. But there's no difference, that's Satan. Why? Foul, right? Serpent, that's pretty obvious. So Widowson describes that. Now, uh, this was uh, the Aztec's patron deity. He's not just their god, he was considered the god. All right, what does the god translate to? Allah, okay, so he was Allah, basically. He was Allah. So to just say Allah for your God don't mean anything, bud. Amen. All right? There were a bunch of pagans who've done that back then. And it was actually Satan, if you find out who the God was. So you have to mention who, uh, who is the God. He has a name, buddy. And God gave his name. All right, let's keep reading. The fate of humankind was in his hands, and he was one of the four sons of the sustainer of the universe. And basically, this other God's name is Omet Teotl. He became the sun in one story and supervised its workings in others. In either one, there was only one way to sustain his energy and receive his blessings. How? Human sacrifice, which was scary. We know this God, like other gods of the pagan peoples of the world, under his biblical names. Satan, Lucifer, Baal, the enemy, the adversary, the accuser, and the devil. In other cultures, he is in reality Jupiter, Zeus, Odin, 
Virakocha, or in his feminine form, Ishtar, Venus, Diana, Sibyl, or the Roman Catholic version of Mary. Under these names and others, called the Celestial Virgin, the Mother of God and the Holy Virgin, by every Satanist from Madame Blavatsky back to the priests of Babylon. So notice that Satan continued his worship system. And if you recall our Intermediate Discipleship World History class, it all goes back to Nimrod and Semiramis. Human sacrifice, also a cornerstone of Baalite religion in the ancient Near East, was made possible by conquest, using the captured in war as the victims, or rather the offerings to the god. So that's what they took. Uh, if you lost a war with them, you better be scared. They're going to use you as human sacrifice then. To obtain prisoners for sacrifice to this Mesoamerican version of the sun god, the Triple Alliance's destiny was to, in Talak Kalel's ideology, so in his mind, to take over the world. So this is the brains of everything that formed up the civilization, the power, the religion, and everything. Mexican anthropologist Miguel Leon Portilla has said that the Aztecs viewed imperial conquest as a moral combat against evil. <laughs> so everything is considered evil to them when they're in a war. So this enemy is evil. Everything we do is for the good. So that's, that sounds like a Muslim, right? Sounds like a good, typical Muslim. These pagan Aztecs who worship idols. They just match the Muslims really well. Because they're thinking that they're doing a battle for their God, and then when they uh, go out and then they do these uh, terrorist acts, they think that it's a conquest against evil, and etc. This is simple evidence at how twisted man-made religions are at the outset. Amen. Like Muhammad did back then. Like all the other religions back then. And how Satan, the enemy of mankind and rebel against God, is often served by man's most faithful and pious efforts. He goes on to say that they believe that the, uh, that the survival of the universe depended on them. So then that's the reason why they had to fight for their kingdom. His two books on the subject are Aztec Thought and Culture, A Study of the Ancient, of the ancient Nahuatl Mine, and The Broken Spears, The Aztec Account of the Conquest of Mexico. So you can look at those two books that would describe it more. Now here's a little bit more of the human sacrifice. Of, cor of course, many modern historical revisionists claim that the Aztecs never practiced human sacrifice in order to uplift the Central American version of the Near Eastern Assyrians to the heights of modern man's moral standards. Yeah, that, that's your typical history books right now. You know why? It's not inclusive of minority cultures. We just seem to glorify too much on white European Protestant uh, culture. So we got to aim, uh, so we got to elevate the pagan satanic cultures more. Why? Because they're a minority based on that. You know what that is? Racism. You're just doing that based on ethnicity, man. All right, let's keep reading here. You know which ones these are? The moral standards that have allowed us to murder 100 million of our own kind in the 20th centuries in wars and genocides. The Aztecs were not much different from our European ancestors in their lack of regard for the lives of anyone considered the others. And this is true of, if you recall, the Catholic Empire at that time, right? Criminals beheaded, heretics burned, assassins drawn and quartered were free entertainment that drew huge crowds in Catholic. And guess what? Yes, even Protestant Europe. Why? Because Calvin burns somebody alive. Yeah, your favorite John Calvin. You Calvinist preachers, you. You don't think about that, do you? The English diplomat Samuel Pepys in 1664 wrote of one hanging that drew a crowd of 12 to 14,000 people who came to watch the victim beg for mercy and paid a shilling for a good view. <laughs> In most cities of Catholic Europe, bodies were impaled upon city walls and left along highways to deter crime. Bodies hung from trees were, were so much backdrop in life, according to one chronicler of medieval and later Europe. France and Spain were the most bloodthirsty of the nations of Europe, and the percentage of population they publicly executed in this way far outshone the brutality of the Aztecs. How about that? So then the Catholics are just as guilty, if not worse. 
if you recall what I mentioned, the worst torture that you can ever think of next to the torture of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Catholic Inquisition. They were the worst that time. Worse than Adolf Hitler, you got to realize. Oh, by the way, who did the worst tortures against our Lord Jesus Christ and his, own, and his own Christians who followed him? Rome. Rome. Rome is evil. Rome has a history of evil. It'll always be evil. Let's uh, skip down here. In their penchant for ceremonial public slaughter, the alliance in Europe were more alike than either side grasped. In both places, the public death was accompanied by the reading of ritual scripts. And in both, the goal was to create a cathartic paroxysm of loyalty to the government. In the uh, Meika case, by recalling the spiritual justification for the empire. In the European case, to reassert the sovereign divine's power after it had been injured by a criminal act. Most important, neither society should be judged or in the event judged each other entirely by its brutality. So I'm going to skip all the way down, but he's just describing how uh, he's trying to justify over here how mankind, they, uh, Catholic Europe, and then the Calvinist empire that time, as well as the pagans, they all shared something in common. What brutality, brutality and torture of people. The fact is that all societies should be judged by God's word alone. And by that word, they fall, fall short. They fall far short of God's standard. And by the Bible's clear words and by the study of history, one can easily see who is leading mankind forward to that final rebellion against our creator. Let's skip down to uh, Richard Adams. Richard Adams, in his book, Ancient Civilizations of the New World, claims that while human sacrifice was the most notorious practice of the Aztecs, they didn't invent it. Oh, interesting. Then if not the Aztecs, who? He reports that human sacrifice was common also, guess what? Their predecessors, Olmec times. The Olmec building and civilization. So you know what? The Aztecs, when they see all of this and the drawings, the civilization, the structure, they must have continued on its satanic practice. Satan worship was continuing on, even though one civilization was wiped out and died. And I don't know what those Aztecs did with those buildings. I don't know if maybe it could be possible. They may have communicated with some spirits or something there. And then maybe the spirits told them to continue on its practice and gave them something. I wouldn't doubt that. I wouldn't doubt it. Why? Because there's so much demon possession this time, you can see. Now, uh, as we're covering the human sacrifices here, the Nahuatl, all of this comes down to their culture. And then we're going to cover their art as well. That's the language of the Triple Alliance, all right? It's Nahuatl, all right? That's their language. The Oxford history, uh, let's see. He does confirm that it was Tala. Uh, Khalil, who gave the Aztecs the practice as a religious expression and what? Psychological terror tool to spark fear in the enemies of the Triple Alliance. So it was all control, see? It was all control. The Oxford History of Mexico, edited by Michael Meyer and William Beasley, has a chapter in it entitled The Mexico That Spain Co Encountered by Susan Schroeder, that gives us some light on the claims in 1491 of the Aztecs' literary achievements, she says. Without doubt, the highest Aztec aesthetic expression came in literature and music. Each Nahua, uh, Albedo, smallest which means the smallest independent political group, similar but not the same as a clan, had its own literary tradition derived from annals, philosophical, theological, and astronomical treatises, dynastic genealogies, and oral histories. Moreover, it, is, it exalted its own heritage and accomplishments to the exclusion of almost everyone else's. So here's another word, okay. In T, uh, so Tli'i, in Tlapal'i, which means the black, the red, was a Nahuatl metaphor for writing. But in truth, their books were filled with brightly colored pictorial images. So then uh, they had a huge library. 
but it was all picture images. But this is interesting, their book. Recorded on paper made from the bark of a native tree, the Amaka uh, Buito, which means paper tree, the Noahs stored their precious books along with maps, tribute records, and other official and personal accounts in royal libraries. But notwithstanding their other literary accomplishments, the Aztecs became masters of history and oratory. Among the population at large, the prevailing wisdom of their sages was presumed to supersede that of everyone else. Rulers, priests, scholars, scribes, and artists collaborated to create an Aztec literary canon. Success in war, the installation of a new king on the throne, festivities in honor of a particular deity, and events called for by the ceremonial calendar were all occasions when books were brought before the public and the privileged information contained therein was revealed. The images in the text were memorized and in concert with instrumental music, dancing, and burning incense. The Nahuatl Song Liturgy re repeatedly brought to life the full pageant of Aztec culture. So that's their uh, Aztec culture and art of that time. Now we come to its famous kings from 1440 to 1468. Moctezuma, also known as Montezuma I, his last name, or part of his name, I don't know, Il, Il Hui Camina, which also means frowns like a lord, helped the Aztecs expand with his conquests to the south. From 1468 to 1481, Agzag moved eastward all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and west to the Pacific. A civil war occurred between the two cities, in 1473, so it's these two cities, all right? And then what happened at the end? And Tenochtitlan proved supreme, crushing Tlatelulco and their allies. The disastrous battle of Zamacuyahuac in 1478 resulted in a terrible defeat for the Aztecs. But in the reigns of emperors Tizuk and Ahahu... Uh, Ahuizotl, okay, Zotl, uh, Zotl, the empire was secured. After the discovery or rather rediscovery of the Americas uh, by Europe in 1492, Spain and Portugal signed the Treaty of Tordesillas, which divided the world between them. Many of the events leading up to this will be covered in the next class, so I want to concern myself with the conquest of the Aztecs here. After taking Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, the island that holds Haiti and the Dominican Republic today, the Spanish went on to capture Cuba and Nicaragua. So they just kept pressing on and on and on, conquering more. But now they're coming toward the Aztec empires. So then uh, Moctezuma the second is the guy that's going to encounter Hernando Cortez. This is the guy that conquered the Aztec Empire. We shall learn and see how he conquered uh, their empire. But what started out as full-blown paganism and Satan worship, you notice that uh, the remnants of it is just being wiped out, replaced with a totally new civilization. It's something where it becomes a Western Empire or a European Empire. Catholic, which is where we're at right now, right? And the devil is building his empire through those means right now. All right, then, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teachings have informed us more about our history, made us understand about the depravity and the hidden nature of mankind, their religious uh, inclinations, and then the darkness behind it. And then may we see that without Jesus Christ, we are truly like them, just nothing. And there's nothing different about today's current civilization. It just matches everything with what the pagans did, the Aztecs, as well as the Catholic Empire at that time. I pray that the church will not follow its example. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.